So as the Night of Philosophy and Ideas began with a Lenape welcome, it is so good and so sweet that philosophy's morning, uh, or else the morning after philosophy, begins with a Lenape sunrise ceremony. So please do join us afterwards in the plaza outside to mark the coming of the new day. Unearthly delights. One, a brief history of life on earth. So, what is life, said the child, taking her hands together at the fire around which they were gathered. Snow falling now over the garden and its follies, and would be for a long time. One of the others, face still shadowed by the dark before the dawn, stupidly braved an answer. The chemical weddings and chemical gardens, the poet began. Bubbles of time froth into thick foam of pocket universes, and some do not burst, but glow and stretch, and gravid with stars, they burn, cool, febrile inventions, bloom in each curve of what is, and now law of motion and orbital path. Lo, call it earth, atmosphere, water, tides, spectral colors in the solar wind. Lo, suns and moons. Lo, crawling, heaving, swimming, chittering, fluttering, glimmering, aggregating, deliquescing things. Feathers, scales, hair. Lo, droves, herds, colonies, swarms, hosts, parliaments, shrewdnesses, nests, flanges, hives, voleries, sieges, obstinacies, congregations, Caravans, flocks, flights, flithers, families, deceits, crowders, glares, intrigues, destructions, prides, coalitions, murders, braces, cries, airies, charms, skeins, drifts, prickles, unkindnesses, clamors, exultations, murmurations, pods, wisdoms, cackles, dazzles, blazes, grists, prides, names, and concepts, touch, scent, taste, lo, sound, and vision, will, desire, city soon, and artificial light, and this invents lo, love, labor, scholarship, war, plague, prison, in factory, hospital, boundary, territory, paradise garden, and if I could tell you. But now there is music, lo, future after present after past, history, lo, metaphor, lo, phosphor, the word that reads by its own light, life before life, the cloud, that the question be not senseless but shining, is the work, a life's work, a life, on earth, on earth, on earth, what is life? Two, the exile of the poets. Peace, peace, thou talkst of nothing, said the philosopher, who was there too by that bonfire. He laid a hand upon the poet's brow with the wariness of a person who has loved and fought bitterly with another person the whole of their tangled lives. This, the philosopher continued, is exactly why they exiled the poets. Why, who exiled the poets, called out one of the others, Use the poets as barricades, said another. I do like to be useful, said the poet, rallying, shaking off the philosopher's hand like a crocodile bucking a plover. For the philosopher inspired in that poet the concentrated bitterness of true intimacy. Philosopher, the exile of the poets, Plato's Republic, Book 10. Poet, and he's off. The philosopher ignored this, bent on their ancient quarrel, Plato's Socrates charges poetry with seductive imitation. Well, the kinds of poetry that aren't hymns to the gods or praise of famous men. Elusive poetry is the problem for the thought experiment of the ideal city. Homer, Aeschylus, Euripides, Sappho, they who feel and water the passions instead of drying them up, inflating sensation and emotion at the expense of reason. Poet, Philosophy's an inflammation of the reason. I get mimetic, you get pathetic. That story. Secretly, I enjoy my exile, she went on. The beds in an ideal city are colder and harder than a mattress of leaf litter on the forest floor. Plato's foolish consistencies bore me, though he, more poet than he knows, stumbles occasionally on the dear gorgeous nonsense of the right image. Winged souls, chariots, horses, Let's not talk about the cave and the sun. What incenses me about Plato, apart from the rubbish of the theory of forms, is his narrow idea of eudaimonia, of life, human flourishing. What short shrift he gives to pleasure, leisure, indolence, abundance, inefficiency, error, fun, delight, as if the best life we know would be ordered by virtue and justice alone. No wild extraneous thing to stain the golden ratios or chip the marble angles. No, not that life. 
nor the parsimony of the Stoics with their dry maxims and parched throats. Better would you stand or lounge on the symposium couch to lie with Epicurus and the chancy music of the senses, with Aristotle's eudaimonia, if you like, under which all other goodness comes. Life as activity, life that weds the rational and the excellent and the pleasurable, if fortune allows, into practice. Life in which there is all the world and some of it utterly useless. Poet philosopher, so you want to talk materialism. Poet, I want to get down to earth, to life above utility and necessity, above sanctimonious stoic rigor, the frothing excess in any life, in every life, that some have called a form of freedom here on earth. I want to talk about what Adorno said, about how wrong life cannot be lived rightly, and all you do is tear your hair about how right life could be lived wrongly. Oh, said the philosopher, well, what is life if not that? Three, old materialisms. Immovable object and irresistible force, the poet and the philosopher retreated from the central scarlet in the grips of their quarrel. Well, what is life if not that? It was Echo who had spoken, absentmindedly, without looking up from their tattered volume of Spinoza, the pages dappled by firelight. Echo was always trying to be a better materialist, but their own lively nature, flickering halfway between sound and silence, sometimes proved a confound. They had often been accused of casting a shadow that looked like transcendence. Deus siwe natura, Echo read, God, that is to say nature. So they thought. Everything in the world must be found in the world. Practically speaking, there's nothing outside the world, nothing we can have. Is that the beginning of life beyond means and ends, to long to know the world already with us, all that is the case? Longing is a different question, of course, but the imminent? Well, it's right there. Oh, thin men of Haddam, Echo murmured, quoting, because they always quoted when they spoke aloud. Why do you imagine golden birds? Do you not see how the blackbird walks around the feet of the women about you? Life seemed to echo then a thin film of liquid verdigree in which they were immersed. The wrangling of poet and philosopher competed with the erratic north wind, their breath visible with each outburst as silver tablets that foamed into quick vapors under the influence of the changeable atmosphere. Echo felt a kinship with the fire, which warmed and illumined the glassy night, but seemed to them as insubstantial as themselves against the star rime of snow and the silhouettes of brambles that climbed the garden wall, Romeo in lust to Juliet. If Echo's face was damp, they told themselves it was only the smoke melting a spur of snow against their cheek. These things seem wondrous, yet more wondrous I, whose heart with fear doth freeze, with love, doth fry. They sang it as if to the child they couldn't have, or a lover, or a wounded creature. Would dawn never come? They were really asking this time. Conatus, Echo read out of Spinoza, the power of each thing or the striving by which it, either alone or with others, does anything or strives to do anything. That is, the power or striving by which it strives to persevere in its being is nothing but the given or actual essence of the thing itself alone or with others, being as perseverance. So, not merely to live, but with others to strive to live in a world arranged for liveliness. Nonetheless, Echo often felt themselves completely alone. They thought, perhaps, sifting through their store of old materialisms, that to speculate about the form of this livelier world was to learn that its materials must come from the given world, all that was human in it, and inhuman too, a world more vivacious, a little humility, please. It could never be the work of a single demiurge. It would have to be a collective project. Call it such reckless abandon, Echo. Call it world-making. A phrase of Marx floated into consciousness. Species being, species life. Gatumswesen. Echo's lips shaped the word. Whatever human life consisted of, as opposed to life in general, it must be something more than striving, alone or together, to persist, surely. Even in a world of alienation, in which so much of existence was experienced as the object of loss, as scarcity, painful and pointless labor, violence, oppression, contest, estrangement from self and other, even in this world, 
Were there not suspensions of knowledge, pleasure, consonants, idleness, cloud shadow passing across an upturned face? How to account for that necessary luxury, which seemed to echo inextricable from these horrors, acute and banal, the apple blossom and the horror, together, a life that refused to be diminished to means and ends. Something about this world-making still escaped them, the wicked arrangements that could not nonetheless suppress all earthly delight. Species life, they repeated, and more marks surfaced as if written on the air in stray calligraphy of smoke gliding off the fire. The whole character of a species, its species character, echo read in memory, is contained in the character of its life activity, and free conscious activity is man's species character. Life itself appears only as a means to life. Life as a means to life, thought echo, mere subsistence as a means to some other form of life we taste only dimly in the world as it is, the estranged world. The life of the world as it might be, which must be imaginable, at the very least, for alienated life to be bearable, imaginable here on Earth. A little more marks welled up. A spider conducts operations that resemble those of a weaver, and a bee puts to shame many an architect in the construction of her cells. But what distinguishes the worst architect from the best of bees is this, that the architect raises his structure in imagination, before he erects it in reality. Yes, thought Echo ruefully, being of nature, we have often been the worst architects. But also, we form objects in accordance with the laws of beauty. Can't seem to stop, despite everything, though I don't know about laws of beauty. The unfinished business of the human, which was unfinished partly because you couldn't know the full extent of how human being might change, what imagination might make of bad arrangements. Lord, we know what we are, but know not what we may be. So, all history is nothing but a continuous transformation of human nature? So, the only immutable thing is the abstraction of movement, mors immortalis, deathless death, the formalism of the materialist all the way back to Lucretius, whom you knew once, Echo, though he, created mortal, never knew you. They thought then of the nature of things, Lucretius's great poem of the material world, that in true death no part of him will stay alive to mourn. Perhaps this was the secret optimism of the passing of a form of life, or of the mediations of art into obsolescence, that they would not live to mourn themselves, that whoever and whatever was left to be made anew of the old materials could say at last, inventing the world all over again, some of the old things were very beautiful, and it is good that they are with us still. Some of the old things were very beautiful, and it is good that they are gone. Echo held this dream of novelty in the theater of the mind, a materialism that encompassed both the bracing negativity of critique and the constructive formalisms of world-making. There, at least, was the seed of a free activity in thought, a vivacity apart from the arid mystifications of vitalism. Even if they could never say it aloud, the new thing. Someone could, perhaps someone was, even now. Memory furnished a line from the scholar Anna Kornblum. Human beings make, emergently, unwittingly, spontaneously, the forms on which their lives depend. And then a line of Shelley on clouds. I arise and unbuild it again. Wrong life could not be lived rightly, no. But to arrange from the given world a form of life less wrong, well, here it was. You could imagine a political system, new means of production and distribution, new kinds of intellection, poetics, music, art, new social forms for a life lived more abundantly. None of it would guarantee the arrival of that world. But without that speculative fidelity to the materials of the here and now, however disastrously assembled, you would be condemned to the mutilation of the actually existing, which is less than half itself without the possible. Matter, deprived of potential, would be a realism without its full reality. The is without the might be, or the might have been. A person cleaved from her shadow, sound shorn of its echo. Could there be, Echo wondered, laughing silently, unheeded tears still falling, each with a little sun or moon or planet at its epicenter? Could there be echoes that rang out before their noises, echoes more vibrant than their originals, echoes of the future here on Earth? Four the apple blossom and the horror. The philosopher's voice, 
still pitched for the poet's ears, broke into Echo's reverie, maliciously with some brecht. Inside me contend delight in the apple tree in blossom and horror at the house painter's speeches, but only the second drives me to my desk. Poet, but it's both for me, the apple blossom and the horror. You know it's always been both. Philosopher, bad time for poetry, my dear. Poet, always is. Not exactly a good time for philosophy, either. Are you satisfied? Philosopher, what satisfaction canst have tonight? The wind carried their voices to another quarter, and Echo was, again, alone with their book and their fragments of critique and song and poetry. Then, some doggerel verse graven in stone on the outside of Spinoza's house in Rheinsberg, where they had never been. Oh, if only all the world were wise and everyone meant well, the earth would then be paradise, but now it's mostly hell. They smoothed a hand over the cover of Spinoza's ethics and didn't notice when their bookmark, a postcard someone had sent them, fell to earth, blank to all appearances, no return address. Echo was in themselves a kind of return address. The image on the front, a painting from the cusp of the 16th century, Hieronymus Bosch's Garden of Earthly Delights. Then what is life, said Echo, to, one, to no one in particular, quoting Shelley again. Five, letter to Echo. The fallen postcard lay, blank surface to the night, between crust of frost and plume of smoke, as if the conjunction of fire and ice had been sympathetic chemical agent to an invisible ink, words developed where there had been no words. This is what it said. Dear Echo, don't know if this will find you, whether you'll be able to read it if it does. You won't remember me, though I am to the eyes what you are to the ears, and we've met more times than we can count. You know the story of how you came to be what you are. No one knows mine, not even I know it. Like you, I am next to nothing. Is this the secret of our success? Someone, doesn't matter who, someone told me you tried to die. Though sound doesn't die exactly, just diminishes forever. I wrote as soon as I heard, though I don't expect it to make much difference. What's more irrational in the world as it is now is to want to live. Still, in the deepest sinews of my being, I know what I know, that the world's marginally better for your having been in it, though no life can be measured in this paltry way. The reasons for this knowledge, inasmuch as reason can give them, are remarkably weak, inconsistent as a world that hath in it the cage of capitalist realism and the music of Nina Simone. Still, have you not taught so many the ars moriendi, the art of dying? That was your gift to me. Thank you. By its light, you gave me to an ars vivendi, an art of living. Did you know that, dear my echo? Angie Malenko, a poet, writes that words are the reverse of pain. She's thinking of the god Apollo, patron of reason, music, light, a god in whose presence tears like all evidence of sorrow are forbidden. Apollo to the left of me, I can't quite believe that words are the reverse of pain. Reason, music, light, don't always cancel sorrow, nor does sorrow always annihilate Apollo's gifts. When you reply, Echo, with your inimitable irony, all that is solid melts into air, and then words are merely the reverse of death. Sending the only thing I can, entirely useless, Bosch's garden of earthly delights. I'm looking at it against the grain, looking for the present, as I always have, my essential error, my wrong life. You can tell me how badly I've missed the mark if we ever meet again. I love best the triptych central panel, the garden of earthly delights itself, flanked on one side by the lost paradise of Eden, on the other by hell. Love it because it resists a dull allegory of sinful hedonism and punishment. True, the colors of paradise carry over to the plane of earth whose human activities ape the ethereal sweetness of Eden, True, the central panel mingles the innocent menagerie of the divine garden with the feverish invention of damnation. But what to make of a genuine current of earthly delight, of imaginative possibility that lives for some of us, for me, in this teeming scene? You would know, if anyone would. At the center of the earthly garden, a fountain, everywhere else infinite detail of human pleasure, strange as if the painter were a tourist from the outer rings of Saturn. Nothing the right scale, strawberries, songbirds, ominous owls, dwarf the antic human figures, whose attitudes are often obscure, not quite recognizable as the choreographies of sex, conversation, use, though sometimes they look like violence. 
More often, Bajas' naked figures seem wrapped in curiosity, as if they were inventing the earth and its objects by sensuous apprehension, but could make no meaning from what their senses gave them. Their characteristic gestures are balancing and reaching, the rider grasping at the tail of his hippogriff mount, the woman who resists the grasp on her wrist, the bather on the ledge of the fountain's blue sphere, stretching an arm towards someone in the water who lifts up hands in reciprocity, the figures steadying peacocks or fruit on their heads. Even the faces of the swimmers around an enormous blackberry seem to lick its flesh as an inquisitive experiment rather than bite to sate an appetite. Our balancing and reaching one form of a life's work. What may be most marvelous about the earthly garden and most terrifying is what the panel shows about the praxis of making a world, which involves necessarily the process of knowing the world and being made and known by that world. What it shows about how much balancing and reaching happens at cross purposes, at the expense of others, in the loneliness that's only possible among others, when you can't see the contours of the forms of life in which we are, all of us, involved, which may be intolerable forms of life, which are, anyway, wrong life. And still, somehow, in the enigma of that florid garden, shadow of a reckoning, swerve into potential, Balancing and reaching, but haven't yet given up on the imagination of a world of abundance, significance that grows from what's most painful, what's illegible in the conditions of the given. Not unearthly delights, but unearthly delights. For what it's worth, you have not been the least of mine. Yours, after image, alias the persistence of vision. The words faded quickly as they materialized. A hungry flame tasted the postcard, converting it to ember, then to ash, the letter that Echo would never read. Who bare my letter then to Romeo? And what then was life? Six, the wrong question. Philosopher, it's the wrong question. It's too clumsy, too much. You've got no right to it. Poet, but we have a right to it. Philosopher, by virtue of living. Poet, just this. Philosopher, no virtue living, poet, no vice either. Philosopher, we're not exactly the school of Athens, are we? Poet, not Raphael's, thank your lucky stars. Maybe Cy Twombly's, he holds the door open. Philosopher, in abstraction, the thing that's just on the tip of the tongue, the verge of thought. Poet, the verge of vision, life. Philosopher, it's the wrong question. Echo, wrong question. Poet. It's the wrong life. Chin up, honey. Echo, honey. They were still at it, the sun rising, the moon a waxing crescent that refused irreverently to yield its place. To the child, the familiar argument was nearly a lullaby and would one day be the music she most longed to hear, if only to be comforted that it was still going on and would go on long after she could go on no more. Seven, the scene. In the child's dream, the sea had been rising all night towards the garden where the fire burned, and she slept, and the poet and the philosopher disputed, and Echo read Spinoza. The child was fascinated, afraid, curious, clever monster. The sea had high hopes of swallowing the garden and everything in it. The dream told the child that digestion was, for the sea, a method of understanding. Though much, much later, when the child was no longer a child, she would consider this merely an unconscious human way of talking about the action of indifferent forces, an image out of the mind of another of the worst architects. The dream garden flooded with the swiftness of thought. The dream waves were the thoughts of the sea. But this was the odd thing, and she never knew whether to dismiss it as naive wish fulfillment. Underwater, they were not drowned. The conversation continued, though sound doesn't carry in the water. Sentences made Baroque arcs of rainbow as they left the mouths of the speakers, though the rainbow language was terrifying, no longer one the child could understand. The speakers understood one another. An echo was there, occasionally reflecting a trill of iridescence that someone or other had lobbed their way. The dream was solace. The dream was dread. It was no life in the sea. It was some life. Some life, Echo sighed. When the child awakened, she was always here on earth. Do we have any questions?
questions? I see one. We've got enough time for about three questions, maybe four. Wow, I've just been thrown away. Uh, I, I kept on thinking of a quote by uh, uh, Saul Bellow, which is, uh, we're so shock resistant, maybe the only thing that can touch us is poetry. Oh, that's lovely. I'm adding that to my floral legend. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, I thought you were about that. Uh, could you talk a little bit about the philosopher and the poet and, and how that kind of flowed through you? Mm, well, um, I began in a place, um, very much resisted beginning, which, which was the Plato's Republic. Um, and, and what is often translated as that ancient quarrel between poetry and philosophy. Um, and uh, I'm a person who, who needs a great deal of, of props and machinery and smoke and mirrors in order to conduct thought, uh, I think slowly and, and painfully. Um, and the poet and the philosopher uh, sort of materialized to help me address this impossible question, which I must point out that uh, in my failings and because it is a collective project I haven't answered, uh, what is life? Um, but it felt oddly like the right place to begin um, to think about the philosophical tradition of people asking that question and attempting to, to think about Bios and, and Zoe uh, with the Greeks. Um, so uh, I hope that explains as, as much as can be explained about it. Thank you. Any more questions? Going once. Ah. So I, I noticed that you read last year as well. Mm -hmm. And in your writing, do you see this event as a forum to perhaps address writing to a particular audience? Or do you deliberate on these pieces and, and deliver them to this audience? Uh, irrespective of, of who's in attendance, or the, like the context of it being at such a late hour, and deliberating about like the role of philosophy and poetry, do you think that <laughs> twilight hour and in the early morning and staying up late at night is the realm of philosophy, or is it perhaps the realm of poetry? Mm. Yeah, so that would be a, a very classical way of thinking about it. Um, that it is the night that is the realm of, of dreams uh, and poetry and the day that is the, the realm of the conscious. Um, for me, these things are, are intertwined, and so I think I'm really drawn to the crepuscular periods, right? Dawn and, and twilight, um, just as a kind of matter of orientation and disposition. But in answer to the first part of your question, I'm always thinking about audience. Um, I think this is a thing that is, that is done together, and it would be uh, a horror to me to to speak without thinking about what listeners might give back to you, um, even if you if you don't always know what that is, um, or if you don't know the, the full implications of, of what intent can do. Um, so in my um, my day job, which is a night job actually, uh, oddly, um, I uh, teach to the working adults of New York City through the Brooklyn Institute of, of Social Research. Um, and so I'm always thinking about um, how the life of the mind is a project that belongs to anyone who wants it and everyone who wants it. And I'm always so grateful to ask to be speak to, to be asked to speak here. Uh, my own uh, exhaustion is perhaps sharing a little bit. Uh, to, to be asked to speak here um, because this to me um, is uh, a full instantiation of, of life lived more abundantly uh, and a real statement that the life of the mind does, in truth, um, belong to, to everyone. Any more questions? I saw one more hand in the background. Hold on. It's not a question. Hold it's on. Oh, that's just you. I, but, um, I got this gentleman back there. I, I, and I'm coming right back to you. 
Huh? You can hire Jordan, not a lot of people. Um, <laughs> what would you say to the idea that to fit poetry and philosophy against each other is a false dichotomy because the first philosophy was actually in poetry? You, my friends. Uh, have spoken more eloquently than than what I ever could uh, about the exact thing that I was trying to to get at. But they can speak to one another, and in fact, that this quarrel is not one whose terms have remained the same throughout time, um, and that poetry and philosophy are always crossing and intersecting and weaving and intermingling, no matter how much philosophy in particular wants to uh, deny the, the connection. Um, but as you say, um, all the way back to uh, the ancient Greeks, people were often philosophizing in poetry. Um, and it's only really um, in, uh, the, in kind of recent progressive centuries um, that we have come to have an idea of discipline the way that we do now. Uh, so many thanks for, for that one. question actually I just wanted to make a comment how beautifully you uh, you recited your poem and the lyrical quality the rhythmic flow and you managed to address all the questions that have come down through the centuries through all the different through all these different philosophers and touched on so many points in that uh, in that body of work so I just wanted to say, this was beautiful. Thank you. It is a privilege and an honor and an earthly delight beyond all earthly delights to, to be here and to, to read and to write for you. Thank you. Well, please, give it all.